started. Um, thanks for coming. We're really excited about having Paul Bogart here. Um, this is his first book, The End of Night. And Paul lives in Virginia and teaches um, creative nonfiction at University, James Madison University. And we're happy to have you and welcome. Thank you. I think I wanted to uh, just jump right in and, and read from the book uh, as a way of kind of introducing uh, why I wrote the book and some of the issues. And then I'll spend a little time showing you a few images um, and uh, read a little bit more and a lot of time for questions after that. I always enjoy hearing uh, people's questions and talking about the issues that you'd like to talk about. Because uh, as you can imagine, um, night and darkness affects just about everything. So we could talk about lots of different things. But, um, so the, one of the joys of writing the book is that uh, I, I got to meet a lot of interesting people and go to a lot of interesting places. And one of the first people I went to uh, talk with is a guy named Bob Berman, who, um, if you know astronomy, uh, you might know that name. He's a longtime astronomy writer, and he's known particular, particularly on camera, <laughs> um, particularly for his sense of humor, which, uh, as he told me, is not the easiest thing to do when you're writing about astronomy. As he said, you know, like, um, what's so funny about Pluto? You know, what's so funny about um, the galaxy? But uh, he had a real fun time when he uh, wrote a column about the stupid questions that he would get from readers, and he called this column, um, this particular column, "F in Science." <laughs> and uh, I really had a, we had a good time together, He's, um, and his favorite uh, stupid question was, um, uh, if solar eclipses are so dangerous, why do they have them? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and my favorite stupid question of, of that he got was, um, does, does Mars have a sun like our sun? <laughs> about it. Um, so anyway, I'll jump in as we're uh, we've we're, we're, we've gone out to uh, he built himself a uh, an observatory. He lives in upstate New York, and he built himself an observatory. And we're going out there to uh, take a look at the moon and Saturn and some other things. So. Of course, the stupid questions column had a serious point to make that most Americans don't know much about the night sky. I used to count myself among that number. I was always drawn to it, but I'd never known its names and numbers, its secret lives. In fact, here is what I did know. Planets don't twinkle, and therefore I could supposedly tell them from stars. And two prominent constellations, the Big Dipper, which technically is only part of the constellation, and Orion. That's not bad, Berman tells me. The only thing most people know is the moon. <laughs> that I know more than I used to has a lot to do with Bob Berman, and especially his book, Secrets of the Night Sky. Here's some of what I learned. One of the stars in Orion, Betelgeuse, is the largest single thing most of us will ever see. Yes, a galaxy is bigger, but a galaxy is a collection of stars rather than a single thing. Anyway, no galaxy is bright enough to shine through the light pollution that covers most of the developed world skies. Betelgeuse, on the other hand, writes Berman, is brilliant enough to bulldoze its way through the milkiest urban conditions. Or how about this? Rigel, another brilliant star in Orion, shines with the same light as 58,000 suns. Rigel's much farther away than the other stars making up the constellation, and as Berman explains, if Rigel were as close to us as the others, our nocturnal landscape would tingle with sharp alien Rigel shadows, and the night sky would always be as bright as when a full moon was out. The moon tonight, a waning gibbous a few days past full, is bright enough that our view of the observatory at the observatory won't be as great as it otherwise might be. When during its 29-day cycle, the moon is big enough and therefore bright enough to wipe so many stars from view, most astronomers are not that excited to see it. 
But Berman seems genuinely delighted to roll back, roll back the roof of his do-it-yourself observatory. Here, take a look at this, he says, and invites me to step up to the eyepiece. I'm not prepared for what I see. The gray-white moon in a sea of black, its surface in crisp relief, brighter than ever before. I'm struck, too, by these scenes' absolute silence. It's clearer, yes, brilliantly so, but this moon seems cold, antiseptic, alone in the unfathomable expanse of space. I learned a lot about the moon from Berman's writing, that it's more brilliant when it's higher, when it's nearer, and in winter, when sunlight striking it is 7% stronger. And I appreciate that kind of information. But I think our relationship with the moon has more to it than simply astronomical facts. With my naked eye, on nights the moon climbs slowly, sometimes so dusted with rust and rose, brown and gold tones, that it nearly drips dirt colors and seems intimately braided with earth. It feels close, part of this world, a friend. But through the telescope, the moon seems, ironically, farther away. Uh, so from the moon, we, um, we took a look at Saturn, and it was, I had this wonderful memory of Bob, who's kind of a big guy with a big walrus, walrus mustache, uh, embracing this big uh, white telescope like a dance partner and kind of turning it like this to, to point it at Saturn. And those of you who have seen Saturn, um, either with your naked eye or with, through a telescope, know that with a naked eye, it just kind of looks like a bright star. Nothing that special, but through a telescope, you get that classic view that we all have seen, at least in photographs, of the round planet with the striated rings. And uh, Bob told me that when he's shown Saturn to um, well over a thousand people, and he says he always gets one of two responses from the people of Earth when they see Saturn. Um, number one, oh my God. <laughs> and number two, that's not real. <laughs> they don't believe what they're seeing. Um, and so I was really struck by that. I think I said, oh my gosh, or oh my God, or something. Like that. You just can't help it. You see it. There it is. Um, but I was really intrigued by this idea of that's not real. And it got me thinking about the value of seeing things for ourselves, not just in a photograph, but actually with your own eyes seeing something. So that's not real. What a curious response. I've had other astronomers tell me the same thing, or say that people will question whether the astronomer hasn't placed an image of the planet into the telescope somehow. The fact that people are seeing something with their own eyes has incredible power. You can see photographs of Saturn a thousand times and be somewhat impressed. But see it for yourself, and you don't forget. The most beautiful starry night I've ever seen was more than 20 years ago, when I was backpacking through Europe as an 18-year-old high school graduate. I traveled south from Spain into Morocco, and from there south to the Atlas Mountains, at the edge of the Sahara Desert, to a place where nomadic tribes came in to barter and trade, a place that when I look on a map, I can no longer find. One night, in a youth hostel that was more like a stable, I woke and walked in, out into a snowstorm. But it wasn't the snow I was used to in Minnesota or anywhere else I'd been. Standing bare chest to cool nights, wearing flip-flops and shorts, I let a storm of stars swirl around me. I remember no light pollution. I remember no lights. But I remember the light around me the sense of being lit by starlight and that I could see the ground to which the stars seemed to be floating down. I saw the sky that night in three dimensions. The sky had depth, some stars seemingly close, some farther away. The Milky Way, so well defined, it had what astronomers called structure, that sense of its twisting depths. I remember stars from one horizon to the other, stars stranger in their numbers than the wooden cart full of severed goat heads I'd seen that morning, or the poverty of the rag-clad children that afternoon, making a night sky so plush it still seems like a dream. 
so much was right about that night. It was a time of my life when I was every day experiencing something new. I felt open to everything, as though I were made of clay and the world was imprinting on me its breathtaking beauty and terrible reality. Standing nearly naked under that Morocco sky, skin against the air, the dark, the stars, the night pressed its impression and my lifelong connection was sealed. Uh, I, I shared that story with Bob Berman about being in Morocco. And he, uh, he kind of nodded and he said, uh, uh, sad corollary to that story was when his mother-in-law, who had only lived in New York City and Miami all her life, came to visit them in uh, upstate New York. And they heard the, her car pull up and the door closed and her kind of walked to the door and there was kind of a pause and then there was a knock on the door. And uh, she came in and she said um, to Bob's wife, um, what are all those white dots up in the sky? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I laughed and I said, I mean, I've heard stories like that, but it just seems so like, really? <laughs> and, uh, and Bob leaned back and his wife was in the other room and he said, Marcy. And she said, yeah. And he said, uh, do you remember when your mom came and said, blah, blah, blah. And she said, yeah. And he said, do you think she was kidding? And she said, no. <laughs> I was just like, no. This is, her mom actually said, uh, what are all those white things in the sky? So, um, I wanted to start with that particular section because uh, for me it speaks to um, much of what this book is about, which is uh, first-hand experience with night and with darkness. Um, with the night sky for sure, but all the other things that I talk about as well. So whether, it, whether it's a regular habitual experience like watching the moon, which I've done all my life, or those uh, you know, specific once in a lifetime kinds of experiences like that night in Morocco. And what we're losing, or even have lost at this point in many places, is the opportunity for this first-hand kind of experience with night and with darkness. Uh, it's especially telling uh, for that children have lost this opportunity. Uh, and when I give talks like this, it's, um, I would say, almost always people in their at least 50s and 60s and beyond who come up to me afterwards and say, this reminds me of when I was growing up and I used to, uh, I had horses and I used to take the horses out into the field and lie back on the horse and just watch the sky. And I never had 20 or people in their 20s or 30s even come up and tell me those stories because most of them simply haven't had that experience. So, um, why have we not had that experience? Well, many reasons, but a significant one is because we were using more artificial light than we've ever used before. And it's increasing every year. Uh, I like to start with this. Um, it's a compendium of, of, of photographs here of the world at night. Um, it's such a beautiful picture in so many ways and so impressive, uh, a wonderful image. Um, it is also an image of waste. Uh, all the light here that you're seeing is either being um, shooting straight into the air or horizontal or bouncing off the ground and going into the air. So um, this is all, almost always. It's also interesting to know where the light is, which is where uh, development is. Develop, light seems to follow development. So there are some you know, dark places left. You can see Australia, Africa, uh, places in Asia and that. And um, people sometimes say to me, um, did you go to Australia, you know, or did you go to Antarctica, and I say, um, I made a conscious decision to not go to those exotic places, because I really wanted to draw our attention to night and darkness in the places where most of us live. Uh, and especially wanted to draw our attention to North America and Western Europe, because we've exported our ideas about lighting and night and darkness around the world, okay? So when you go to, um, when you travel to other countries, the story of that. This is in the book as well. Roger Nardoni, who designed the lighting plant for Paris, um, told me that he travels all over the world. One of the things that makes him most sad is that um, everywhere he goes, the night looks the same now. 
because everybody's using the same technology, same colors, same, uh, and the same mindset. So, um, a few other images, a little more. Some things I like here, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, you can see that going across there. Um, close up of the uh, Korean Peninsula, and believe me, I'm not advocating for uh, North Korean lifestyle, um, but I did want to point out uh, the dramatic difference here between South Korea, here's Seoul, and North Korea. You can see, um, here's an even closer look. A close up of the US. Uh, one thing to notice here, too, it kind of looks like there's there are um, black places, you know, on the places throughout here. But we'll come back to that um, in a second. So what's making all this light? Uh, this is a shot of the town in Virginia where I live now, Harrisonburg. Um, you see here uh, one of the main culprits, stadium lighting. Uh, this is the school where I teach. These are intramural fields. They leave the lighting on all night long, whether there's, uh, it's kind of for advertising, I think. Um, you also see not a single star. It's white, pretty much wiped out here. Parking lots. I like this shot here. We often see this empty parking lots lit all, all night long. Um, gas stations. Okay. One of the most significant uh, uh, statistics that I've learned is that in the last uh, 20 years, gas stations and parking lots are now lit 10 times as brightly as they were just 20 years ago. Are we here okay for that? Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody recognize? Uh, I guess the one thing I want to point out here are the billboards, the bright uh, LED billboards that are spreading across the country. This is actually Piccadilly Circus in London, uh, bright billboards. I don't know if anybody else thinks this is funny, but this is me, um, one the night I was there. I love the fact that the camera can't focus, right? It's so bright that it doesn't know what to do, so. Uh, up light, lights that are, you see this on signs, the lights are uh, shining upward, so they're going to hit the, this is a Northland College where I taught one year, hit the sign and go straight into the sky, that does a great job of lighting the trees, any birds that fly by will be well lit, um, but uh, we're wasting a lot of light there. Parking lots again, and I wanted to point out, these are um, horizontal lights, um, we call these wall packs, they're just simply lights that shine straight out. Uh, this is a good example of what we call light trespass. This is the brand new science building shining its light not only on its property but across the street onto the women's awareness house where students are living and having to hang black curtains in their windows to block out that light. Uh, this is again the science building do a fantastic job of lighting up the neighboring woods. It's ridiculous. We don't. There's no reason that this should be lit up at night. So, um, sky glow is, uh, is a real common thing around every uh, major city. This is a shot of, um, from a, around a suburb of Toronto in 2003. There was a power outage, and the uh, one of the guys who lived on the street walked down the street and took a picture of what it looks like during a power outage, and that's what it normally looks like. So I want to go back to this, these, this image again, and this is, uh, I'll show you the US after this as well. Kind of notice the different, uh, the black spaces in between the lights. It almost looks like it's bright in the cities, but if you go out into the country, it's, it's not so bright. About a dozen years ago, a couple of Italian astronomers wanted to show the actual extent of light pollution, the true extent, and to show that, in fact, there are no places here that are unaffected by light pollution. So they came up with something that looked like this. So you can see, uh, except for this, the ocean here, you might get back to real darkness, but all this is, um, there's light pollution in here. <clears throat> Here's the US, and one thing that I like to point out is that this is data from 1996, so it's almost 20 years ago. Uh, it has not gotten better, it has definitely gotten worse. They did a really neat thing, though. They, uh, they took the 1996 data and they estimated backwards to show us, give us an, an idea of what it looked like or what it might have looked like. They also estimated forwards to 
to show us what might happen if we don't do anything about it. And then they put these all together. I hope you can, you can see this. This is uh, the late 50s, middle 70s, 97, 96, when they were, the data they were using. And then here's 2025. Uh, you can see basically the whole eastern part of the country is, uh, there's not nearly a single uh, lack space left. This is an example of uh, uh, what we call the Bortle scale. Uh, John Bortle, who's an astronomer uh, from upstate New York, came up with the scale to kind of, to, to give us an example of, uh, to rank levels of darkness, starting with nine being the brightest area, it's down to one being uh, primordial darkness. This just gives us nine, seven, five, three, one, but you get the, you get the idea. Um, one thing, I, a couple things I wanted to say about this, most Americans live most of our lives in five or above. We no longer experience this kind of darkness, okay? But I thought this was a really great uh, organizing uh, tool for my book. And so when you look at the table of contents in, your, in my book, you'll see that I actually start with chapter nine, and I work my way down to chapter one. So I'm starting in, the br in bright places, working my way down to dark places. Can you guess where I started? <laughs> I started in Las Vegas. <laughs> so classic, I wanted to show a few uh, ideas of, uh, three examples of, of actual lamps and, uh, and what we can do about this, this problem. Because one of the things that's exciting to me is that this is an issue I feel like we can really do something about. So here's a classic, what we call security lights. Uh, designed to provide security. This is my picture of it. This is out in uh, rural New Mexico. Uh, and I just wanted to show how this light is just shining in every direction, right, all over. I don't know what it's designed to light, really. This is uh, the post office in this very small town. There's actually a really good light right here that's lighting the parking lot. This light, I'm not, it's like somebody set it up and then left and <laughs> never, uh, never came back. So often when we're talking about uh, lights and why do we need all this light, people will say, well, we need it for safety and security, right? We need all this light. I think the, the trouble that we run into is we think that because some light helps make us more safe or more secure, that more light will make us even more safe and more secure. But actually what often happens with more light is that we cause problems for ourselves. Uh, some of those problems, glare, okay, bright lights that are shining straight into our eyes and blinding us, right, making it harder for us to see. Bright lights also create shadows where the bad guys can hide uh, or escape to, that kind of thing. So I'm going to show you two back-to-back -back photographs uh, that really uh, show this in a dramatic way, I think. It also shows in a dramatic way the effectiveness of shielding lights. So tonight when you go out, actually the lights in the parking lot here are really pretty good lights. They're flat glass lamps that are only allowing light to shine down. So you can't do this trick on those, but find a street light, uh, especially like, uh, well, these lights out here actually on the street, these cobra head lights that are shining down and spraying light all over the place. Hold your hand up and block them and notice how better you can see underneath them. We'll do that with this photo. There we go. So here's the uh, security light keeping us safe from the bad guys. Did anybody see the bad guy on the other side of the light? We shield the light and the bad guy is right there in the fence. So again, this is to, to think that, show you how dramatically shielding our lights actually help us see better. At the same time, it is helping uh, control light pollution. Uh, parking lot here, kind of a similar thing really brightly unshielded lights. Here's a truck. Uh, they took a picture with the flash. You can see the bad guy hiding behind the truck here. So this is kind of, this is to dramatize shadows, the way lights catch shadows. Ball fields spraying light all over. You shield those, you have more light on the fields, uh, less light in the sky. This is what those shields look like. Even on our homes, we have bright lights to shield those. It's much nicer. You can shield these security lights. 
it's a little, might be a little hard to see, but this has a shield on it. This is what you're going to see more and more, these kind of lamps with the light. <laughs> That's great, a visitor. <laughs> <laughs> What's significant about this light, why it's an improvement, is that the light is up in here. It's not shining all over. It's only shining straight down. Also, there's no glass in the fixture, so there's no, the light isn't allowed to bounce around either. And that's kind of the effects uh, that they have. They're really nice lamps. Albuquerque street lights. Uh, this is in Florence, Italy. Uh, similar kind of thing. And uh, what's dramatic about this is, uh, I make this point again and again, the folks that I talk to, I heard so often, we're not saying no lights. Right? We're going to have lights. But let's use light intelligently. Right? Let's use as much light as we need, not more than that. So when you have lamps like this, uh, that are, are not, they're not shining in our eyes, they're not shining into the sky, the street looks more like this. It's a little out of focus because I took it, but uh, you can see all the way down to the end of the street. There's nothing shining into your eyes. Again, this is a problem I feel like we can really control. This is an example that uh, astronomers have made of current cities in, in Arizona. This is what they estimate as shielding. And the, the secret with shielding is that once you shield your lights, you don't need to use as much light, as much energy. So in Flagstaff, Arizona, where they have a lot of shielding for Lowell Observatory, uh, they actually use less light and less energy. So they also estimated what would, uh, this one I think is Vegas right here, what would Vegas look like if the lights were shield, shielded? More like this. What would Vegas look like if we if we used as the same amount of light as the Flagstaff would? Look? More like this. So just the point here that this is a problem that we can do something about. A couple more slides, and I'll I'll read a little for a, a little bit more from the book. But I wanted to make the point that light at night can be so beautiful. Uh, it, it, this is you know Big Ben in Parliament in London. Notre Dame, but, uh, they, they spent, um, I'll talk about this in the book, they spent a, over a decade relighting Notre Dame. Um, kind of a funny story, that, uh, one of the guys was telling me that they really wanted to light the rose window, light it up at night, and the priests refused, they said they were the devil. <laughs> Another one of the lighting designers wanted to put a strobe light that would go the length of the church on the top of the hour. Anyway, they can get carried away, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> Lighting is, is, again, beautiful, symbolic, right? Candlelight vigils. We don't do this in the middle of the day. We do it when it's dark, right? We need darkness for lights. We need darkness for the natural light, the beautiful moon, the beautiful stars. What about for art? It's a painting that you probably know, Van Gogh from Arl. Uh, in the 19th century, the same time he painted the Starry Night that is real famous. I'm showing you this one because I went to Arles to see where he painted the Starry Night and to see where he painted this. And you can go to the actual spot where he painted this, where he set up his, his easel and painted it, looking out at the river and the, the couple down here, the gas lights on the, on the river, and the Big Dipper, which actually was behind him, he transposed the Big Dipper to make it a better picture. They've actually figured this out. The astronomers have figured this out. So I was excited. I was going to go to this very spot and stand there and imagine, you know, 125 years later, Paul Van Gogh. No. Uh, so I got to that spot at night. This is what I saw. Right Here's the, here's the plaque saying, on the spot Van Gogh painted. This is what you see as you walk up toward it. You're, by the time you get to the spot, you're, you're blinded. You can't see anything. So. Anyway, it's kind of a funny little story. Toward the end of the book, uh, I end up in Death Valley National Park, which is one of the most wonderful places I was. I was. And uh, this is the night's a pretty good representation of what the sky looked like that night. Um, here's the glow from Vegas down here. Even in this very, very um, wonderful spot, we still have some light, and I'll end with this one, it's a shot um, from Death Valley at the racetrack um, with the Milky Way there, so um, when I went to um, 
In nonfiction books, oftentimes, uh, so if you write a novel, unless you're very famous, you write the whole novel, and then you try to sell that novel to a publisher, and they want to read the whole book. One of the great things about nonfiction is that you can sell the idea. You can sell the proposal, right? You can say, this is the book I'm going to write, and that's what I did. But you normally have to have a chapter or two to say, this is what it's going to look like. I didn't have a chapter or two. And I, my editor, who uh, I did end up working with, said, I love the idea. I want to buy the book. But I have to have some writing to show to the other editors to convince them this is a good idea. Just give me something. And I said, well, um, I am flying off to Vegas this weekend to drive up to the Great, to Great Basin National Park for their astronomy festival. Why don't I write about that? And he said, great. So I flew from Minneapolis, where I was, this was about three summers ago, to Vegas, got there in the evening, rented a car, and started heading north. And um, it got dark, and it got really dark. And um, I was out there all alone with all these stars and all this darkness, and I remembered uh, when I was a teenager in Minneapolis, driving home to my parents' house through a golf course where I used to turn off the lights on my car and drive through the golf course on the road. And I would be going about 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. Um, I was going much faster than that <laughs> on, on 93 going up to Ely. Um, I thought I'd read from that section here. This is the experience that I sent to my head of it. That was you. What's that? Yeah. Said that was you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Hope there are no police in the eyes. In the Minneapolis suburb where I grew up lies a golf course with a road coming through its center, white picket fence on either side. As a teenager, I drove an old Volvo box that allowed me to turn off its headlights and sail a sloping, curving road lit only by parking lights, 35 miles an hour. The red wagon I own now is too smart and safe for that. The headlights remain on whether I want them to or not, and I assume the same is true of my brand new rental, but I am wrong. The temptation is immediate and irresistible, and despite the fact I'm not going 35 miles an hour on the straight highway, but nearly three times 35, I rotate the dial. In an instant, the road disappears, my stomach drops, and I feel as though flung from the edge of the earth. The sensation is exhilarating fear, as my every fiber demands to know what I'm doing. I turn the headlights back on and feel my heart return to beating. The highway before and behind me holds no other cars, and no artificial, sh artificial lights shine in the black sea on either side. I turn the lights off again and again, longer each time, long enough for my eyes to focus on what little of the highway my parking lights reveal, long enough to look ahead at the starry night flowing toward and over and past, and think of Starship, Star Trek Starship Enterprise accelerating into space, long enough to feel the car begin to float from the road's surface and fall into the sky. The temptation is to leave off the lights to drive in the dark for more than these few moments. But while I'm happy to know the thrill of boldly going 100 miles an hour through the desert at night, to feel catapulted from Earth into space, I am also happy to be alive. <laughs> and so I slow to 20 miles an hour. It's what seems now a trolling speed, and so I turn even the parking lights off and lean my head from the driver's window. The warm, dry air flows over the asphalt rolls underneath, and I realize I'm headed directly toward a meeting at the horizon of the Milky Way as it bends from one end to the other. <coughs> as though on its own, the car slows to a stop in the middle of Route 93, in the middle of the Great Basin Desert. Any car or truck coming from either direction will show long before I need to move. Unless, of course, they are driving with their lights on too, <laughs> staring up at this altogether other highway. So I put that, uh, and there's more obviously into the writing, and, and uh, 
and packaged it, and that, that became the introduction to the book. Um, I'll close with a poem from Wendell Berry that is my epigraph uh, at the beginning of the book, and just a, a few other paragraphs. Um, but let me just, again, thank you for coming out. Um, thank you to the library for having me tonight. It's really a pleasure to be here, and, and uh, I am very happy to answer questions afterwards, too. So, um, this is a poem by Wendell Berry, the Kentucky poet. <coughs> He says, to go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. Our sun is one star in a disc-shaped swarm of several hundred billion stars, writes astronomer Chet Remo. That disc-shaped swarm is our Milky Way galaxy. What arcs in three dimensions above this dark Nevada desert is the outer arm of that spiral toward which we look from our inner galaxy location. Chet Remo continues, I have often constructed a model of the Milky Way galaxy on a classroom floor by pouring a box of salt into a pinwheel pattern. The demonstration is impressive, but the scale is wrong. If a grain of salt were to accurately represent a typical star, then the separate, gra separate grains would be thousands of feet apart. A numerically and dimensionally precise model of the galaxy would require 10,000 boxes of salt scattered in a flat circle larger than the cross section of the Earth. This means that every star in our night sky, every individual star any human has ever seen with his or her naked eye is part of our galaxy and it's several hundred billion stars. Outside our galaxy, galaxy exist innumerable other galaxies. One recent estimate put the number at 500 billion. At some quick point, the size of the universe becomes overwhelming, its distances and numbers bending our brains as we try to comprehend the incomprehensible, that our night sky is but one tiny plot in a glowing garden too big to imagine. But of course, for all of human history, we have indeed imagined. Ancient civilizations from North America to Australia to Peru created constellations not only from groups of individual stars, but even from the black shapes made by the gas and dust that lie between Earth and our view of the Milky Way's smoke-like stream. And for ages, we imagined it might well be smoke or steam or even milk. Not until 1609 did Galileo's telescope confirm what he suspected, that the Milky Way's glow was the gathered light of countless stars. In these countless stars, in their clusters and colors and constellations, in the shooting showers of blazing dust and ice, we have always found beauty. And in this beauty, the overwhelming size of the universe has seemed less ominous, Earth's own beauty more incredible. If indeed the numbers and distances of the night sky are so large that they become nearly meaningless, then let us find the meaning under our feet. There is no other place to go. The night sky makes this clear. So let us go dark. Thank you. So, any questions about writing or the subjects or anything? Yeah. Do you know or have any idea why in that half of the United States, uh, why it's almost a distinct line right down the middle? You know, uh, I had that question a couple nights ago, and I, I don't actually know. I used to think it was the Mississippi River, but it's not. Yeah. It's further west than that. And yeah. I think it's just uh, just where it happens to be. Yeah. Yes. How do you, how do you get cities to start decreasing some of the lighting? I was thinking that the other night, just trying to watch the sunset. Yeah. Um, and the street lights are so close together. It's yeah. Like, why do they have to be that close? Can you not have even like every other one or every third one? How, right. do, you, how do you start up on that? Yeah. I think a big part of it is simply raising awareness. Uh, most people 
uh, don't even notice lights at night. You know, they don't even notice what you notice. Um, so to get people starting to think about that um, is, a, is a big part of it. There are a lot of different steps we can take to control the lighting, um, different arguments you can use. Um, again, it's a, it's a big waste of energy, all this light that's going around. When you shield the lights, uh, you need to use less energy. That's been the main selling point for a lot of dark sky ordinances, is that we can save money. And that's why people have turned out lights. Um, I think the safety issues, again, the reason why people say, oh, we need all this light, but if you really get people to start to think about it, we'll actually be safer uh, if we control our lighting. Right? Um, awareness is a big part of it. Ordinances are a big part of it, just encouraging uh, uh, rulings. Um, the, uh, what was I going to say? One of the, one of the guys in, in London that I talked to said, once we get good lighting just as part of the building codes, that'll make a huge difference um, because then people will simply put in good lighting. And there's a lot of that going around now. Like when I was in Albuquerque a couple of weeks ago, all the new street lights I saw were, were shielded lights. Uh, another example of things that are happening, Lowe's, the, outdoor, uh, the home improvement store, now has a line of lighting called uh, Good Neighbor Lighting, which are shielded lights. Uh, and up until they had those, if you wanted to buy a light, whether you knew anything about light pollution or not, and you went to Lowe's or Home Depot or something else, you had no choice but to buy a light that contributed to light pollution. Now at least you have a choice. So there's, these are ways that are kind of we're building it into, um, just building it into the society. Um, but the bottom line, I think, is it just comes down to awareness. To, you know, um, hopefully folks that read the book or hear me talk saying to their friends, did you ever notice light pollution? <laughs> I sometimes feel uh, a little guilty because it's everywhere. And once you start to notice it, you're going to see it everywhere. You're going to go out tonight and be like, oh my gosh, why did we? No. <laughs> I was blissfully unaware. Paul, can you talk about the Harvard study, the personal health? Did you mention that in the book about medical people needing light? Are you thinking of a particular study? I mean, one of the. Uh, <clears throat> so, again, the book has nine chapters, and within each chapter, I'm sort of gradually moving ever darker, but I'm also focused on different subjects. So there's a chapter on uh, the ecological effects of artificial lighting. Uh, there's a chapter on safety and security. There's a chapter on um, kind of the spiritual or metaphorical uh, importance of darkness. Um, you know, life is dark sometimes. And we, the subtitle of the book is, uh, talks about artificial light. I mean it metaphorically, too. We live in a society that's full of artificial light both literally, literal and metaphorical artificial light. Um, so I want to talk about that. But there is a chapter on human health. Um, and some of the things that are, uh, I guess, most compelling to people, even if, if they don't care particularly about the stars or, or environmental things or spirituality, they, they, they do uh, care when you start to talk about cancer, for example, or sleep disorders, uh, or... Uh, how diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular problems are tied to the disruption of our circadian rhythms by exposure to light at night. The things that researchers uh, have found and that they argue is that all life on Earth evolved with bright days and dark nights, and we need both. Right? We still have the bright days, but now we have the bright nights as well. We don't have the dark nights. Uh, and it's as though we are um, conducting an ongoing experiment on ourselves to find out what's going to happen. Already, um, the World Health Organization uh, lists uh, the night shift, working the night shift, as a probable carcinogen. So that link has been made already, uh, particularly in uh, um, breast cancer and prostate cancer. So, I, you know, the, the experts that I talked to said, you know, we can't say light at night gives you cancer, because they, they can't make that direct correlation. Um, but they can say that it sure seems like uh, we have a huge number of sleep disorders. It's epidemic. Um, light disrupts your sleep. Uh, disrupted sleep is tied to every major disease we're fighting now. Um, and lab results seem to point to 
the suppress suppression of the production of the hormone melatonin in our bodies as being linked to breast cancer and prostate cancer. So it's pretty compelling. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert, but when, when these guys at Harvard say to me, I can't tell you for sure that light gives you cancer, but why take a chance? Sleep in the darkness. I think, yeah, I think I will sleep in the darkness. So. if you're interested. Um, I'm thinking of it now because uh, Ian Cheney, who made the movie, went down to Florida and filmed some of the beaches, the trail beaches down there. And there's some really, um, in many ways, sort of heartbreaking video of uh, turtle hatchlings coming up out of the sand and being drawn toward the hotel lights and the street lights. And as he said, you know, the ones that they filmed, of course, they picked up and helped to the oceans and that kind of thing. But you know, that's hap that happens regularly, um, and um, they don't survive if they go the wrong way, they need to go to the ocean. Um, that's, see, I don't talk about sea turtles, but I've heard a lot about, you know, there, that, again, is um, some cause for optimism, that at least people are aware of this problem, you know, the sea turtles, and a, a number of Florida communities, for example, have ordinances to try to control that lighting. Um, but for, for all of Every ecosystem uh, in all over the world is impacted by our lights. And I think I've had people describe the effect of artificial light as um, destroying habitat as effectively as any bulldozer would for nocturnal and crepuscular creatures. They simply cannot survive when we flood their um, habitats with light. So your book is being powered by NASA. Yes, it is. They're very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, they chose it as a best book of the month, um, and Barnes and Noble did too, so that's good. And uh, if anybody reads, <laughs> if anybody reads Reader's Digest, it'll be Reader's Digest. <laughs> <laughs> My grandparents would be very proud. <laughs> Set the brakes 
uh, enough breaks and the catastrophe that happened after that. And I immediately thought, because um, of blaming the engineer for not setting the break, and I immediately wondered if he'd been working 24, 36 hours in a row and just, you know, there's, that happens more than you think. Uh, there was a, uh, a couple of years ago in Nevada, there was an Amtrak train and a semi that collided, and they, they traced that back to exhaustion. People are being asked to work insane hours and through the night, and it's having costs. Good questions. Any other, any other questions or thoughts? In Taos in Mexico, it's a dark sky ordinance, and all the lady there is shielded. Are there any other communities? Yeah, in fact, uh, um, I was just in Taos for a couple of weeks recently, so I got to see that. In fact, the whole state of New Mexico has a lighting ordinance. Um, whether it's uh, enforced statewide is another question, but at least it's on the books. And what I saw in Taos and Santa Fe and Albuquerque are that all the new lights are um, fully shielded and what we call flat glass. So there's, there's uh, the light is just going down. Um, it's not to say that there are folks in here that no lighting at all, you know. Um, a lot of these new lights are LED lights, um, light, emit light emitting diodes, and they have their problems too, um, because they, they, many of them cast a certain uh, blue light that's not so good for us. So, you know, they're not a panacea for our problems, but shielding is a wonderful step, and I just saw in Taos and Santa Fe, Albuquerque, all the new street lights are, are fully shielded. So, again, I think, we can do this if we, if we make our minds up to do it. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.